Welcome. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. Thanks for being here. All right, friends, welcome. My name is Lena Blunt. I mentioned I'm the education coordinator at Pendle Hill, and I'll be sort of your guide and MC for the evening for August 1st Monday lecture with Christy Randazzo on a Quaker um, theological ecosystem. We're really pleased to have you with us tonight. I just want to orient you to some of the technology um, and our um, patterns around technology that we embrace for these first Monday lectures. You may notice that you are muted and you cannot unmute yourself. That's a decision that we've made for these lectures, which can be quite large. Um, it allows us to cut down on background noise and it also allows us to live stream and record these lectures to our YouTube channel, Pendle Hill USA, for people's viewing later. Um, so just so you know, we are um, recording tonight um, and we'll be keeping folks muted um, so that we can manage that background noise. Later in the evening, we will have some time for question and answer. And during that time, you'll be sending in your questions in the chat, um, which is down at the bottom of your screen. It's the little um, kind of comic word box um, and in the chat there you can put in your questions and I will be moderating the question and answer. So I'll be reading questions from the chat, consolidating some of the questions as they arrive and offering them to Christy for response. So just to orient you to some of the technological choices we've made for this evening, um, you will be muted. The chat is just to the hosts. Those are things you can expect. I'm really thrilled to have you all joining us tonight. And in a moment, I'll invite us to go into waiting worship. Christy will speak out of the silence to deliver their message. Before we do that, I'd like to share a little bit more about Christy. They're a convinced friend and a member of Haddonfield Friends Meeting in Haddonfield, New Jersey. They're a theologian and teacher whose work has been engaged in bridging the divide between the contemplative nature of theological writing with the active lived theology of congregational life. Christy teaches at both Montclair State University in New Jersey and the University of St. Joseph in Connecticut, where they offer courses on religious peacemaking, introduction to religious studies, and the intersections between theolo theology and piecework. They've also done ministry across multiple religious communities in diverse settings, including youth and young adult ministry, chaplaincy, and religious education at both the high school and university level, social ministries amongst unhoused populations, and peacemaking in situations of ethno-religious conflict. They've written in a variety of both academic and popular settings, including the Quaker Biblical Study series Illuminate the Politics of Scripture Project for the Journal of Political Theology, which they also help edit, two books for the Brill Quaker Studies series, and an upcoming book for Bloomsbury T&T Clark, Quaker Theological Ecosystems, a Quaker Constructive Theology. They've earned several degrees in theology, including an MA in General Theology from St. Mary's Seminary and University, and a Master in Philosophy and Reconciliation Theology from Trinity College Dublin, and a PhD in Quaker theology from the University of Birmingham. I invite you now to settle into waiting worship. And Christy, as you're led, I invite you to speak out of the silence.
Good evening, folks. The uh, weird thing about being introduced um, is when someone reads out all the things you've done in your life, you have this weird sense of like, wow, is that really me? And then you start thinking, no, that's just all a big lie. I'm, 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 I'm faking it all. But then you realize, no, actually, um, I have done all that and, and it's okay. Um, and one of the things that I've discerned um, being and claiming the title of theologian um, for about a decade now is that it is far less impressive than one might think. Um, and I think of it as more of a question of um, ascribing to a discipline and a way of being, um, a way of viewing the world than it is of um, a title that I get to claim um, or say that um, I'm impressive because I do this thing. Um, so one of the challenges that you encounter um, when you are a, a friend is when you do claim this title of theologian, um, you go out into the world and you have you know, experience with people and they ask, oh, well, what do you do? And then, you know, you have that weird, you know, feeling of like, well, do I answer as an American and do I tell them what I do to make money or do I tell them who I am? Um, and at some level, I think that, um, you know, the beauty of sort of claiming um, theologian as a vocation is that um, if anyone ever thinks that they're going to make money as a theologian, <laughs> that's the first joke. So it's not a question of um, money. It's more of a question of a vocation, you know, and like going the idea of vocare, um, the Latin root of vocation, which is to call. Um, it is a sense of calling that I'm doing this thing, knowing that I don't really know what I'm doing. And as with anyone with a call, you're, you're, you're trying to sort of wrestle through it and trying to work your way through it, particularly if you're a theologian who claims to be a friend as well. Because most people say, Quakers don't have theology. Or they go, wow, that's kind of a waste of time, isn't it? Shouldn't you be worrying about saving the whales or feeding the homeless or um, housing people or um, any number of useful, very productive ministries? And I want to start there. That question of what is the purpose of actually studying theology? And if we think about the word itself, theology, it has that logi at the back, which just means logos. Um, it's sort of, you know, if etymologically, the root of something, um, it comes from the root of theos logos. So this Greek, you know, sort of portmanteau, um, which means um, wisdom, words, knowledge, uh, ideas about the divine. So at some level, how I, I, I respond to that question is say, well, even a rejection of theology is itself a theology because, you know, all it is, a theology is just making a, um, some kind of statement or knowledge about God. And if you're saying there isn't, you know, there isn't such a thing, then you actually are still making a theological statement, which sounds like kind of a gotcha. Um, and I guess in a way it kind of is. But now that I've sort of accepted that and said, yes, okay, fine. That's kind of, um, I, can, I can say that and go, ha ha, fine. I then return to the actual reality of it. And this question of what actually is the purpose of theology, I would say is at core to find a way of engaging with the divine, with your whole person which necessitates using your mind. And one of the challenges of, of being a Quaker theologian is that we do really focus on and we do highlight the experience, the, the, the bodily spiritual experience of you know, resting in the divine presence of the light within us, which is an astonishing reality. And yet, if 
that's all we do, if we just simply experience it, then that doesn't actually get us anywhere. The experience then automatically then gets pulled up into our mind as we start thinking about, well, what happened? What does it mean? What does it mean for my life? If you just want to experience something, then at some level that doesn't actually, you know, lead you to the next important question of community. You can yourself experience the divine, but that doesn't bring you into a community of people who are also doing the same. If you're just sitting around in a circle and you never actually engage with other people asking about what do you think about that or how does this mean for your life, then you are kind of just doing meditation individually but with other people in the room. What Quakerism is about is that intersection between that individual and communal at all levels of what it means to be a Quaker. So we are always wrestling with you know, the individual experience, the individual vocation, the individual work, which then also is a communal work. Quakerism is that intersection of the individual and the common together. So now returning back to the question of what's the purpose of Quaker theology? Well, I would say that it's akin to um, something along these lines. If you are going to, let's say, um, lobby the US government for something, okay? As a Quaker, you have some resources. You could contact Friends Committee on National Legislation and they've got tools. Oh my God, my, my inbox is filled with the tools of FCNL. They tell me who to call, they tell me who to engage with, they tell me literally what to say. So they enable the work that I do with FC, you know, with lobbying, they enable that discipline of being an engaged citizen by giving some tools. And then I, with the tool, I then apply it in my own individual way. After I've engaged with the community of people whose job it is to really make a specific intent to learn about how to lobby. The same thing is, for example, you know, I do not spend all my time trying to um, serve the unhoused community anymore. I did for a time, it was my job, it was a wonderful job, but I do something else now. And so if I want to engage in the work again, then it's not gonna be something that I'm doing all the time. I engage with other people whose at some level job it is to, to, to facilitate me engaging with that work in the ways that I can. So I think of it as a theologian, there's a role. And granted, there aren't a lot of professional Quaker theologians in our community. And you know, there's a reason for that. There aren't that many because maybe we don't need that many. We're not that big. But the challenge we have is that we've so rejected the idea of theology oftentimes that we don't actually even know that we don't no, which is a really bizarre situation when you don't know that you don't know something. So tonight, what I want to do is I want to go through some thought experiments about um, how could we, re you know, sort of maybe conceptualize what our theology is and how it could start, you know, intersecting with other communities that we can then, you know, not just be Quakers and do our theology, but we do Quaker theology with the wider Christian community, Quaker theology with eco-theologians, Quaker theology with feminist theologians. We can start thinking of our theology as something which is beautiful and true and has 400 plus years of really in-depth thought that we all engage with every time we engage with anything that is connected to any thought process, any framework, that is our, 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 our way of being has been shaped by Quakerism. So for example, you probably see behind me, there are four Quakers. 
And they each have a specific statement that they're possibly, I wouldn't say most well known for, but really well known for. And they're there behind me in my office to remind me. These are words that just as I meditate, as I pray, as I engage in my work, I continuously remind myself, these are these foundational ideas that have rooted me in um, this, this community, that have rooted me in this way of thinking. And people for, you know, four centuries have wrestled with these ideas and they've changed them and they've shifted them and they've, you know, applied them to their own circumstance and context. And what they do is they remind me about these truths. And then I think about the truths and then I try to apply them. So if you've ever read anything from any Quaker, if you've ever heard the phrase, let your life speak and thought, hmm, what does that mean? You've done theology, folks. It is that simple. So Without further ado, I wanna actually get into a little PowerPointing. I'm a professor, so I tend to really like it, but I'm gonna to try to not make it incredibly boring. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in, shall we? I'm gonna share my screen really quickly here. And so I believe we can all see this. Um, if uh, folks wanna shake their heads or nod their heads, there we go, great, okay. so. I'm gonna go ahead and keep it in this mode because if I start doing the, um, you know, the whole slideshow thing, it could get a little weird. So we're just gonna keep it in this. As you can tell, I am not um, uh, paid for my technological expertise or for my artistic talent. So I'm just gonna hold that right there. All right, but I like the little, you know, ecosystem kind of thing background here. Little, you know, a little obvious, a little on the nose, whatever. All right. So a quick story. Um, when I was about, I'd say, 27, 28, I was a youth minister in the Episcopal Church. And I was trying to wrestle with what I was actually doing with my life because I was doing ministry full time. I was doing that practical work, but it didn't feel as if it was speaking to my mind in the same way that I felt like I was called to, um, to speak. And I also was wrestling with the ideas that had been, you know, that I, that I initially thought were really important and, you know, how one's faith life works. And, and they never really spoke to me in the same way that um, I feel like they must have supposed to sp speak to you. And I think a part of that is Around about this time, I feel like I started to pay attention to the metaphors that we use about thought itself. And when I started hearing the technological emphasis that we've allowed to sort of seep into our way of thinking, I realized that something was kind of wrong here. We're not technological. So when we have, you know, a, an idea, we're not downloading it into our brains. We're engaging with it. We're wrestling with it. We're organically shifting it. it it's not a download. I, as an introvert, when I get off this, you know, this lecture, I'm going to shut my computer down and I'm going to need to have a break. I'm not resetting myself. I am having a break. I am resting as an organic being must rest. My computer doesn't really need rest. My computer could run for the rest of time until it breaks and then it's broken. That's not how we work. A computer can't heal itself. I then started looking at so much of the theology and the ideas that I'd been sort of told to think were important. And around this time, I was also in um, seminary at night. And so much of them emphasized um, this enlightenment idea of the, the, the human being as a mind, which might have a soul, and the body is being this disconnected thing. And that if the body ever, you know, intersects with the mind, then it gets impure, I guess is one way of putting it. Our 
mines were seen as the, you know, the place, even in, you know, some of our, 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 our most famous, most powerful mystical texts in Western Christianity. Um, it is if, like, it, there's, there's this image I have from Meister Eckhart, which I remember reading it and, and, and fundamentally, like, it sort of struck me in the face as having the experience of feeling as if Meister Eckhart was walking up the stairs into his attic and pulling the door behind him and he was in his brain and his brain and his soul, which was in his brain, of course, were interacting with God and the body was just kind of cut free. And that didn't work for me anymore. So I started looking for what other metaphors would work, what other ways of imagining our world. And I just opened my window. And I don't know if you can hear it now, but the windows are purposely open because I am surrounded by noise. There's birds, there's crickets, there's wind. The world is around me. I am not just a monad bouncing about the world. I am literally the world. I am creation. I am a constituent part of it. I breathe out air. And as we've discovered in the last year and a half, the air that other people breathe out, we breathe in. The waves of energy we put out into the world come back to us. We are in, you know, like in this impenetrable, like, like interdependence. We are, we are interlocked. And I opened my window and I looked out and I saw a tree. And I realized that sounds kind of, you know, weird and lame, but I saw a tree. And not this absolutely gorgeous weeping willow, but it was a weeping willow. And I started pondering, what does this weeping willow have to teach me about the world? And there's all kinds of things you could take from that. You know, the fact that, you know, the willow is actually incredibly Versa, you know, a, a, a incredibly flexible. It will bend with the wind. All as opposed to an oak, which is very hard and tough, the willow will bend. A wind comes, it's going to move. The willow has, you know, some of the, the strongest roots. If you ever decide to grow a weeping willow by your house, don't. It will destroy any um, foundation you have. If you're too close to the house, it'll destroy your pipes because it just keeps going until it hits water. It does not stop. It is implacable in how much it desires water. So I thought, wow, this tree has a whole richness to it. And then from there, I was like, okay, let me reimagine theology. So let me tell you what theology is not. And not just Quaker theology, but theology in general. Theology is not a wonderfully easy this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. It's not a system. And it doesn't matter if it's a president, vice president. Like Basically, it's not this. If you think this is theology, and when people respond that Quakerism doesn't have a theology, they look to this. And they think, well, okay, A to B to C, that's not how we work. Well, okay, sure, yeah, that's not how theology works. Theology is not this, um, even though sometimes... It feels like that way when I'm sitting in my office by myself. Um, it's not just intelligence scribing on a book. It's not just books. It's not just learning. It's not just some medieval old dude. It's not specified. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is one framework of it. But if you'll notice, there's a second edition appended on that. This is not... Theology for the end of time. Even the Roman Catholic Church acknowledges that theology can change, that it is flexible. Quaker theology is decidedly not a catechism. It is not one lone person trying to find the truth by themselves, the seeker who cannot be, you know, who cannot be told what to do. And Quakers, we hate being told what to do, don't we? So we think we're the lone individual striding across the landscape. Well, you know, theology, it's a communal effort. 
And your theology, if it's not being informed by other people, well, it sucks, frankly. It is not just pondering the mysteries of the universe. It's really not. This might be a wonderful way to get to an idea, but this is not itself theology. And this is not Quaker theology. It is not just you sitting in meeting by yourself, you know, connecting to the divine, divorced of the rest of, you know, the world around you. No. And it is not the game Operation. So I don't know how much you remember about the game Operation, but you have to get this little thingy here, the little tweezer, and you have to pull out each of these little bones and things without touching the sides. If you touch the side, the electrical charge goes and you've made a mistake. You have to stop your turn. This metaphor of theology says that theology is not defined until you break a rule. And then you know you've broken a rule because suddenly everything goes to crap and people go, you've broken a rule. Theology has to be more transparent than this. And yet this is kind of what Quakerism is. As a convinced friend of 12 years now, I can tell you, we often operate as if we are operation. You don't know what you are doing wrong until you discover you're doing it wrong. That's not theology. It's not our theology either. Instead, it's all of it and more. If we look at this picture, we see a rich ecosystem. We see, you know, these nursery trees lying here. And I think that's what they're called. Trees that die. And then as they die and they break down, they start, you know, giving the the fruit, the, the energy for new life, they are decomposed and in their decomposing, they are continuously giving of new life. These trees are talking to each other. They are interacting, they are not individuals. They will send chemicals and pheromones and all kinds of things out into the air and then underneath their roots, they might actually have the same root system. They might be shared as a root system. There is so much going on underneath the ground that we don't see because all we see is what's in front of us. And yet the beauty of an ecosystem is that there is no one thing that defines it. It is not a tree. It is not a fern. It is not a piece of mold. It is not a mushroom. It is all of it working all together all at once. You cannot say that one thing is what an ecosystem is. A forest is not just trees. Same thing with theology. Theology is, at some level, it is a way of thinking. We do have a system. Anyone who's ever told you a testimony list, and Americans love their spices, I can tell you that, um, that is a, a system in a way. It tells you S-P-I-C-E-S. That's what we're about. If somebody wants to ask you what Quakerism is, well, they can say, you know, let your life speak, and there's that of God within, and spices. Boom. You've told Quakerism. Well, that's not what it is, but at least it's a part. Quakerism is theology, it is learning. You have to read. You have to read the journals. You have to read the faith and practice. You have to, you know, read, oh my God, the minutes. Oh my God, the business meetings. Oh my God, we do our theology practiced. So it is a reading thing. It is a knowledge thing. It's not a catechism, but wow, this kind of looks like a faith and practice, doesn't it? In a way. It's not a lone person, but you yourself have to seek your way in. And Quakerism often is people who have found their way into the faith. They have found their way into this community. They have sought out something different and they have come upon this. It's not just, in, you know, meditating with all that is, and yet it is a part of that. It is speaking to the divine. It is engaging with how the divine speaks to all of us and through all of us. There are rules to how we do things. 
There are ways that we do and that we don't do. And we, we teach people them, we learn them. You make mistakes, you are eldered in meeting. Not that that ever happened to me 12 years ago, the first time I spoke in meeting and discovered that uh, there is a time limit. We learn how to be Quaker by doing it. And then we bump up against the rule and we discover, okay, well, that's, that's not what we do. That's, that's not who we are. It's all of it and more. So when I was trying to figure out what Quaker theology actually meant when someone said, hey, I'm a Quaker theologian. Then you go, well, well what is Quaker theology? You go, I don't know. It's a very good question. Quaker theology, that's ecosystem, is both a metaphor. It speaks to a sense of how theology works, but it's also a very specific logical description. How can it be both? Those are my favorite scenes from the movie Shakespeare in Love. Strangely enough, it all turns out well. How? I don't know. It's a mystery. Theology is a mystery. Somehow the paradox of this being both a metaphor and something very specific, it plays itself out. Now, what actually is an ecosystem? I'm gonna go ahead and um, very briefly encapsulate what the dictionary says there. The dictionary says that it is a community of organisms and the environment functioning as one unit, all right? So the many combined into the one, all right? Now, then you've got this something such as a network of businesses. We have used the, you know, the word ecosystem so much in other settings now that now we're talking about like Silicon Valley is an ecosystem. The Northeast corridor from Boston down to Washington DC is at some level an ecosystem. Things interact, they depend upon each other. Again, anyone who had any trouble getting anything from fiber to toilet paper to cars to wood lumber the last year, you've discovered we are in an economic ecosystem. Something really random can happen and then suddenly ripples all the way down. So this isn't something that's just, you know, weird and metaphorical, it's true, okay? So how does this apply to theology again? Good question. Let's return to this definition. Something resembling an ecological ecosystem, especially because of its complex interdependent parts. So I wanna just have you ever, you know, take a moment and, and, and look at the, the slide uh, there. One well-known model for showing the sources of theology. What we gather theology into and, and the sources that we gather, you know, and then, and then make a theology from, one framework that's really well known is the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And that, well, quadrilateral means there's four parts. There you go. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Now, in most Christian settings, scripture means exactly what it says. It is the Hebrew Bible. It is the Christian Bible. And um, that is what we understand to be scripture. But this can apply in other settings. Scripture is not just a Christian term. Muslims use it, Hindu, Hindus use it. it. Scripture is just holy text, sacred text. So this actually can work if you think about it applying in other religious traditions. So, you know, I've laid out some ideas of possible ways of thinking about how, how this could possibly work. Well, um, who might prioritize each of these resources? Well, Protestants are very well known for prioritizing the scripture. The idea of sola scriptura, it's only the Bible, only scripture. Some Quakers do the same thing. Islam as well. You know, this, the Quran being literally the word of Allah. Tradition. And, and yes, I'm, I'm hearing topol in my, my head right now. Um, Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodoxy, Judaism. Tradition is what the community has said about itself and its theology. Um, and then you, you interpret that through the lens of that tradition. Reason, humanists love reason. 
because I think it, it makes sense to me. So therefore this is what it means. I think about the world through a lens of reason. And then you have experience. And I put Pentecostalism down there because if you've ever seen people slain in the spirit, that is a physical embodied encompassed experience. It is, it is beautiful. And for anyone who is not in that tradition, it's kind of shocking. But then again, so is, you know, unprogrammed worship, a bunch of people staring at each other in silence. It's kind of weird from outside. We experience the divine in this unusual way in waiting worship. So at some level, we highlight experience over any other aspect, or at least we say we do, we think we do. So each of these you know, sources people think is the more primary one. And then I thought, well, it's effective. It explains things, but it doesn't explain everything. And it doesn't actually have a priority. It itself is an ecosystem. All of those sources are present. We want to go back really quickly. Is there tradition? Uh, again, faith and practice. Um, again, all of the rules that we have that we don't actually write down, but you learn when you're elder. Scripture. For many Quakers, it is the Bible. But can we view, can we see scripture differently if we wanted to? For some Quakers, could it be the writings of George Fox? Could it be a sacredness, some text that we view as more important than others? How about reason? You know, we think, we use our brain and experience. Again, what we say is our raison d'etre. What we say is who we are at, at a core is reason, is experience. Okay, but it's all here. And you can't take any of those parts out. If you did, then it would be poor. It wouldn't be Quakerism anymore. So what are some Quaker sources of theology? I'm gonna go ahead and pause the, um, the whole PowerPoint thing here briefly, um, because I feel like I've been talking in from a PowerPoint a lot. But what I want you to think about is we are a people of story. First and foremost, Quakers derive their theology from our stories about ourselves. We read and write journals. We read and write business notes and, 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 and minutes, and we return to them. We read and write queries, and then we engage with them continuously over and over and over again. We return to stories about ourselves. We learn how to be Quaker, as I said. We experience the stories of our community. We pay careful, careful attention to our elders, and we experience a life of the community through our rituals. We are becoming Quakers through our stories. So first off, our narratives. That's what makes us Quakers. So what else? What does it mean to be a people who derive their sense of themselves from story? Well, It's all of it. It's the metaphors we tell. The idea of light, that's a metaphor. It's just a language that we use. I have to explain when I, you know, to someone when I wanna say, I'm holding you in the light, I have to explain what that means. I have to translate. But once I translate it, people go, oh, I get it. It's just a language and language is story. It's mysticism, it's spiritual disciplines, it's beauty. It's silence. It's all of these things, all of these things together. But at core, it is the stories we tell about ourselves, the community engagement, and the worship that we all share. So these are our sources of theology. But we can't 
say that we are just worship or that we are just story or that we are just metaphor or that we are just practice slash testimony. That's not just that. It's all of it, all at once, all at the same time. So if you try to say, how do you develop a Quaker theology? You have to have all of those things working all at once and they all interact and intersect with each other. So as with any ecosystem, if you remove one part, it starts to fall apart. It ceases to make sense. So let's return to this really quickly. So there we go. When I either thinking, okay, if I wanted to write out a Quaker theology based on the metaphor of ecosystem, how would I do that in such a way that I, that would make sense, that would translate to other people, that would translate to other Christians, that would translate to ourselves? And I have these main elements. One, it's a rejection at the very beginning of mechanistic enlightenment. And this is where the eco-theology part comes in. How we think and engage with the world, the language we use to describe our way of thinking and describe the world around us and how we engage with it, frames our reality and shapes our perspective. If we're using mechanistic language, then we can think very easily mechanistically. If we talk about trees as resources, as, dear God, bored lumber feet, if we think about water as purely something which, you know, we can bottle, if we think about air as something that you can literally buy the rights to, you can buy the rights to air, okay? then we think about our world mechanistically. And it shapes how we think about the divine. We think we can put the divine in a box. We think we can have Quaker time be a specific moment in time. Oh, it's 10 o'clock. I've got Quaker time beginning. It's 11 o'clock. Quaker time worship ends. Okay, I get up. I leave my time as a Quaker, it ceases in the same way. The way we think about the metaphors we use frame how we imagine our world. So if we, again, think about theology as just a dude and a book, or just as dogma, then that's what our, our theology is going to look like. That's how we're going to react to it. So we have to reject the mechanistic enlightenment. We have to use metaphors that talk about us as organic beings connected, interdependent with the divine upon the earth. Then we talk about experience. A little phrase here that you might've heard, this open me so that it cut me to the heart. Testimony, let your life speak. Interpretation, we have to use our mind. We have to interpret. You will say Christ saith this, and the apostles say this, but what canst thou say? Doctrine. We too often, thank you very much, uh, Lucretia Mott back there. We too often bind ourselves by authorities rather than by the truth. Doctrine is at core, we're afraid of it, but doctrine is just teaching. And it's teaching that can change. If we are a community that believes in continuing revelation, then we, we, we can't just emphasize the continuing part. We do have to emphasize the revelation part essentially too. What is What truth is the divine revealing to us? And that's just a teaching and that can shift. So when we talk about, you know, uh, are we going to bring in a new understanding of a testimony, which we spend a lot of time thinking about? Do we have a new testimony to sustainability, for example? That is doctrine. That is a teaching. So. These are a Quaker source of theology. We've got experience, testimony, interpretation, and doctrine. So now what does that look like? If we're trying to develop a theology that is whole and holistic and connected, well, it's going to have all these pieces woven in it at all times. You can't just think about doctrine as, you know, 
bullet points. You've got to think about it as something which it must be experienced, must be lived, and must be interpreted. But your experience is not just you in the bench for an hour and whatever happened in your head at that time. It is something which must engage with the teachings of your community or else you're really just sitting there kind of, you know, staring at yourself. It, it must be in conversation. So why is this necessary? Okay. Um, how many people on this call, eh, just a rhetorical question, have engaged with the idea that Quakerism is dying? Have we really wrestled with the fact that we're shrinking? Like worldwide? Um, hold on one second, hold that thought, hold that question. Um, but I'm gonna say Christianity is also shrinking. It's twisting. It's shifting. What we understand Quakerism to be is, is, is shrinking and changing. We are not as impactful as we could be. I became a Quaker because, oh my God, George Fox lit my soul on fire. Why are other people not learning about George Fox? And I say, it's a translatability question. We have no idea how to translate what we have, these rich resources out in the world. I go to conferences, I, I write theology. I have, I guarantee you, I have never been in the room where anyone has ever read any of the important theologians that I refer to who know anything about Quakerism except, oh yeah, you won a Peace Prize once. And these are people whose job it is to study the theologies of the world. Nobody cares. And yet we're here because, oh my God, this is astonishing. We can't, we can't pollinate. We can't grow. Our ecosystem cannot expand and grow and breathe and become you know, as amazing as it could be, because we have no idea how to translate who we are to others. We're afraid of it. We're afraid of doing this work, I would argue. So one theologian's proposal, how we could imagine what a Quaker theological ecosystem would look like. There's a lot of ecological metaphor going on here. So let's start off. Where are we rooted and what gives us steady, strong purpose? What gives us strength? How do we experience ourselves and the divine in our communities? So if we start, you know, the kinds of questions that we need to ask, discover what are our roots, is how are we experiencing the divine around us? And, and, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But then once you come up from a stem, you then have a flower. What are the processes of turning this divine experience into life? How do we pollinate? How do we live and, and experience this living, beautiful thing out in the world? Photosynthesis. How do we interpret this paradox of the continuous revelations of the eternal divine light? How do we interpret this paradox of the eternal yet continuous at the same time? That's photosynthesis. It is an astonishing process. All a plant has to do is just sit there and they suck in the sun and they make stuff. That's amazing. That is better than any machine ever. So, Photosynthesis is a lot like interpretation. How do we take this light? See what I did there? Light, sun, yay. This light, and how do we make it into stuff? The fruits, what emerges from that? What doctrine, what teachings? Again, just, just think of it as teachings. What testimonies, what ideas, what new ways of being emerge from this revelation? And then seeds, 
we get to the point of now we've got to grow something because it's a cycle and go forward. How do we anticipate the changes which will emerge on the horizon? What seeds do we need to plant to think about what's next? So I'm gonna kind of breeze through the next, you know, rest of everything. Cause I just wanna show you how this looked like in my brain, okay? If I started thinking about translating the, the language of theology generally, so we're talking about sin, the end of the world, who is God, who, is, who are humans, um, what is good, what is evil, um, all that, the usual questions of theology, how do I translate that into a language that works for Quakers, that can then be sustaining and can reframe our thinking away from the enlightenment where we separate our head from our body and re-align it with the reality of our teaching, which is that we are all the divine. The divine is in us and through us and around us. The divine light being in us and the divine light that is in me is always interpenetrating me and interpenetrating you. We all are interconnected through this. That is the core of what it means to be that of God within, that there is, there is that of God which intersects all of us. And it's not my little piece of God, my one little piece of light. It is light that interpenetrates us all. So it can't be mechanistic. It can't be my reason in my head. It's all of it. So what does that look like? A thought. Okay. Roots. I started throwing down some ideas. Okay, who would be the, the, um, the, the people that would talk about the really big things? Okay, where are we anchored and to whom are we connected? Well, creation. Boom. At its core, the creation. Right now, we are all creation. You will die. You'll be eaten by worms. And the worms will have a great time. And you will then feed the next life. John Woolman had something to say about that. Our bodies, our bodies ourselves, our, I, literally we are bodies. We are embodied people and individuals. And the older I get, the more very aware I am that I am in fact a body. Margaret Fell had a, some great things to say about our bodies. Let's return to that. The divine, if you've never heard of Ham Khan, who is a uh, amazing Korean um, Quaker who did some really incredible, um, you know, hybrid thought where he was bringing Buddhism in line with Quakerism, in line with Korean Presbyterianism. And like he created this, like this, like how do I imagine God in this whole hybrid mess? Well, isn't Quakerism kind of hybrid at this moment? We've got so many different communities coming in, so many different people, so many different ideas. Hamsa Khan can give us some ideas about how to do that. What our divine, what the divine looks like. Okay, so stems, what emerges from that? What are the communities which give us structure? Well, our families. Elise Boulding had a lot to say about that. Civil society. This is way Madhala Rutledge had a lot to say about that. G race and ethnicity, Gordon Hirabayashi. Gender, Lucretia Mott. Class, Elizabeth Fry. Our faith community. Benjamin Lay has a lot to say about our faith community and how we fail each other. If we can come back to these people and we can find a way to translate their teachings in ways that other people can access and can see as useful for imagining a new way of thinking of the world, wow, that'd be amazing. Okay, now I gotta show you a flower. Now, I am not a biologist. That's my spouse. I know nothing about science, except I know what it looks like. And if we look at a flower, we see the perianth, which is the whole structure holding the flower, giving it structure, giving it support. And then inside, you've got the pistils and the stamens and the pollen, all this yummy little stuff that basically allows reproduction to occur. 
it's both beautiful and practical. So there's two parts of the flower. There's the structure and then there's the thing itself. So what are those? Well, the periants are how do we experience the, how do we desire experience with the divine meet the world? Okay, how do we who encounter the divine, how do we take that out? How do we give structure to the flower of this divine knowledge? Well, there's testimony, there's disciplines, there's narratives, there's ways we speak about living in the world. There's the testimony, the very concept of testimony. What it means to be a Quaker is to testify to being a Quaker through one's actions. So we can't do a theology if we're not talking about our testimony. But then we've got the pollen. What are we fertilizing our lives with? And these are the testimony themselves. And I, I had some, some fun with it. We talk about spices, but there are other testimony that we have engaged with throughout time. So if we have consistently reimagined the concept of testimony from hat honor to sustainability, then let's reimagine it a bit. Let's talk about a testimony of mission, not missionizing to you know the natives, something horrible colonizing like that. No, your mission, how do you live out your testimony in the world and have others see the, the testimony and, and learn from it? Presence, justice, equality, hope. Maybe we've got other ways of being a community that other people in Quakerism have spoken to. And by the way, each of these is a, if you're engaging with Christian theology, each of these is a Christian theological concept. It's a community. It's a, it's a whole tradition. Like beauty is, it has its own theological tradition that you can engage with. Uh, like, you know, Hans Urs von Balthasar is like the king of the theology of beauty in the Roman Catholic tradition. Wouldn't it be amazing if the Roman Catholics were like, hey, Quakers have something to say about beauty. Let's pay attention to that. Okay, photosynthesis, that interpretation. What does this look like? Okay, well, we have a Quaker approach to teaching. We've got at root Christianity, but other things that emerge from that. We've got the community around us. We've got testimony. And then we've got this continuing revelation. So we've got teachings, and then we've got teachings that change. So how do our root core teachings engage with the constant change that God always calls us to? So can something be stable, but also unstable at the same time? Hey, it's a paradox. It's a mystery. Fantastic. So we've got these other ways of thinking about how does revelation work? Community memory, authority. We listen to our elders. We listen to our weighty friends. We give them a term, weighty friends. They speak and we listen because they can teach us something. We translate our, ourselves into other languages, not just the language English to Swahili to Spanish to whatever, but again, the language of theology to other languages, the languages of all the, you know, the languages you might speak. How do I engage, you know, in this language of theology with my spouse who does this really amazing, incredible work to like try to protect the environment? It's very practical. How can I speak in such a way that my spouse can hear me? It's just translation. So then we've got really quickly coming to my conclusion. Creeds, doctrine, and belief. If you want to think that Quakers do not have a creed, huh, no, 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 we do. Just like the game operation, our creeds are quiet. But you know when you've broken them. They're not defined, but you know. We have belief. The Quaker business method. This is core to who we are, right? We learn about Quakerism through doing this. What can we teach about how to learn about the divine's revelation through this business method that we can teach other communities that might want to learn? And by the way, the Episcopalians love Quaker business method. 
They are huge in Quaker business method. They just don't call it that. They call it discernment. A Quaker, a long time ago, translated that and created a business and sold books. And when I was an Episcopalian, we bought those books from a Quaker and it was Quaker business practice. They're doing the work already. And then faith and practice. It is an interpretive tool. And if you've been paying attention at all to the challenges that Britain Yearly Meeting is having right now, wrestling over what their faith and practice is going to look like. If you think faith and practice don't matter and the doctrines don't matter and the teachings don't matter, guess what? They obviously do. Now, what is the fruit? What is What ideas, what teachings emerge from all of this? And very quickly, what is the creation? Who is the human? What does it mean to be human? Who or what is the divine? These are, as you can see, these are questions that theology is already wrestling with. Panentheism is like, if you've ever paid attention to a theologian named uh, um, Sally McFaig, panentheism is like the entire core of her theology. It is a hugely important aspect, and we already do it. We're already talking about it. We have both a Christian element of Quakerism, we also have a universal element of Quakerism. The divine presence. We talk about God, not just a Christian sense, but in a the divine of all things. The light, the metaphor of light. Thinking of it both Christian and universal. What separates the community and the divine? Sin and evil. We engage with this. Anthropocentrism, which is the center, the human being the center, okay? We focus on our needs before we focus on the, the needs of anyone else. So like I said, we can easily tear down the Brazilian rainforest because, well, you know, people need, need jobs. People need board feet of lumber because we focus on first the human and then everyone else. Now, how do we heal these divisions? So we talk about sin, division, evil. How do we heal them? We talk about liberation, reconciliation, interdependence. We remember that we are fully dependent upon the divine. The divine, in some sense, is dependent upon us. And we are dependent upon each other. If COVID has te taught you anything, it has to be that the world is far more connected than you ever thought it was. And then finally, seeds. Where do we take these ideas and then sprinkle them forth? These are the questions we have to ask. What is our history? Where have we been? So it's wrestling with our history, our heritage of racism just rooted in our, our very way of being. How do we wrestle with this and what do we need going forward? Where are we now? These kinds of questions about looking around. Where are we and where are we going? How do we anticipate the future of Quakerism? How do we anticipate the future of a world that is dying? How do we heal it? These are these huge questions that we're all asking and these are the questions theology asks. These all are just pieces of theology as a discipline. Quakers already do this. We just don't see it as a unified thing, but theology does. So as I started off saying, this is just my way of imagining this. How can we think about our theology differently? How can we reframe what we think about and how we experience the divine in our communities in a way that's going to be fruitful and life affirming and life giving and will allow us to have questions that are going to um, be fruitful questions and not just antagonistic questions. How can we translate our amazing theological, spiritual, ethical um, foundation 
these resources that we have, how can we translate them so that the rest of the world actually pays attention? That's in some sense my job, but it's also all of our jobs. Whenever you're in a room and you happen to say, oh, I'm a Quaker, and someone goes, oh, you're a Quaker. Guess what? You've done witness. You've done evangelism. You've spread the word about the existence of Quakers. And then by seeing you and what you do and what you're about, your testimony, you are preaching Quakerism to others. And this isn't, you know, knocking on your door and saying, have you considered Jesus and, you know, as your Lord and Savior? No. You are doing what St. Francis did, which was to say, preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. At core, we're following a tradition that is very, very old. And I want us to remember that and to try to actually return to that tradition again. Re-engage with it. Take it seriously. So I don't have to have another conversation with somebody at, you know, a potluck with Quakers. And they say, what do you do? Well, I, I write and, you know, teach theology. And they go, wow, that's a waste of time. If I could never have that conversation again, that would be fantastic. So there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy. I will say I'm getting lots of questions in the chat. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, and please do submit them in the chat because it also allows me to see where we might have some similar questions and bring some of those similar questions together because I know now lots of folks are thinking about this piece and they have a question about this piece um, and it helps with some discernment about the questions in the group. Um, because we're a large group. Um, so thank you for, for putting your questions into the chat to me. I will share some of these out for Christy to respond to. Um, I think you just spoke to part of this at the end here, Christy, but there's a couple of folks who are asking just for a, sh a sharp or a clarification of, you know, what I hear you saying is that you're translating a friend's experience into theological terms. Is that correct? Is one of these questions. I'm saying that I am trying to show y'all that you already are translating your experience into theological terms and that you should claim that and um, take responsibility for that as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, at some level, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a theologian. I will think from that framework. That's, that's, you know, I, I think about this all the time. I obviously read, I, I, you know, all this stuff all the time. A lot of the, this stuff is, I'm going to grant you boring, but it is about trying to frame your way of thinking in such a way that you can see how to translate it to others. And so that you can see if someone is talking about sin, that maybe you can say, hold on, hold on. I might have a concept of sin too. I might not define it the way you do, and I don't have to accept your definition. That's the beauty of theology. I can disagree with what sin is, and I do, trust me. Mm. But I'm still talking about sin. If I see that, um, you know, for example, um, it is fundamentally sin that... Um, you know, black people in this country are um, systematically oppressed. That's sin. It, it, it just is. It might be unjust. It might be, um, you know, immoral, all other words, but at core, it is sin. And we can just call it that, that way because other Christians who are using the term are calling it sin. It's not just waving your finger and saying, well, you know, you're, you had sex before marriage, that's sin. You know what? There's a whole host of Christians who have gone past that, who said that's a waste of time. Let's talk about the structures of sin. Sin just being, there's a way that the world could be. The beautiful vision of what the world could be. And, and we see it and we feel it. And then we got our world. 
So the space between what we could be and where we are, that's just sin. There's a couple of questions coming around this theme of individual and community. And relatedly, the sort of, um, I'm getting a couple of questions around the role of the individual and the role of the community, kind of relating to this idea of eldering um, and and there's this piece here um, trying to kind of combine a couple questions. Um, one friend here is saying, you know, I'm convinced that I have a real communal experience. Everyone in the circle or room has to take the risk of describing their experience or interpretation, which is not easy at all. It's a new skill for many. And more to the point, few actually take on the challenge. Quakers like to repeat, but what canst thou say? The sad reply is, but what do you say or share? Otherwise, how do we discuss, support, or challenge each other in a true spiritual community? I think this speaks a little bit to this dance of experiential and communal and eldering. You know, you talked about, oh, there, there is a time limit on, on worship, for example, as a, an eldering you've received. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to cap, encapsulate the question in this, but there's a couple of folks speaking to this dance of the individual and the communal especially right. as it relates to experience. Yeah. So I think of it as, um, if, we, if we think of being Quaker as a discipline, and again, maybe like if we can think about, you know, um, discipline differently and not, you know, discipline how like a parent might like, you know, discipline a child. But even that, like um, what, what, what discipline is, is to try to um, frame how you are in such a way such that you, as you've learned the practice, as you've learned the, the value, as you've learned the testimony or the virtue, the more that you learn it and you make mistakes, you get better and better and better at it, but you have to keep practicing it. So the more that you practice it, the practice itself becomes sort of the self-fulfilling thing where you're always trying to engage it and you're always trying to learn and you're always trying to you know, and, and, and the more that you learn, the more you discover that you have to keep talking to others in order to keep learning. So, um, you know, for example, uh, I, I absolutely love um, uh, the Allman Brothers Band. I, I will own this. Um, I love the Allman Brothers Band. Um, and, and what they did was they basically just jammed. I'll admit it. I am white. I love jam bands. And what I love about jam is that it's also linked to jazz. This idea that with jazz, there is a structure, even in free jazz, there, there is sort of a sense of what we're doing, but we're, 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 we're teasing things out. We're playing with ideas. And then if that idea stops working, then you maybe stop playing. And then somebody else will take it up and we'll teach you maybe how that idea could be better. And, and through that interplay of going back and forth of play, we actually allow ourselves to learn more and not just learn how to play my instrument, but learn how to um, actually create the music that we all are there to create. So at some level, jazz is always a little different each time, right? Jam bands, it's a little different each time because they're interacting with, you know, with the, their own context, their own situation, the people that they're playing around it. So we need to think about, you know, like eldering even. Like we're so afraid of getting it wrong, but that's an mechanistic enlightenment thinking. You know, you go into a forest and you don't go, well, the forest is wrong. No, if you've ever been to a forest plantation where it's literally planted, it is the most weird Stepford freaky experience ever because it's it's exact it's perfect it's as it should be and that's not a forest that's not an ecosystem so you have trees that have fallen in weird directions and you have you know trees that will break and trees that will have bend in this weird off thing they're playing they're trying to learn so we need to reimagine eldering as less you're being told that you did something wrong. Um, and that's not very Quaker because if we believe that 
it's continuing revelation, then at some level you could be right. It's more of a play. You are playing at the discipline and somebody else is possibly aiding you in teaching you. Now, so mm -hmm. if you're going to elder, you need to be aware of that and not just sort of wag your finger. And I've experienced that. It's a, it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really serious, important, you know, uh, practice to take on. Mm -hmm. So if that's helpful by way of a response, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, wonderful. Um, one person wrote sort of a specific question. They don't know much about some of the other Quaker theologians you share. You did explain a little more about Ham Sun Hyun, um, but they don't know uh, Nozizwe, um, Mandalala Rutledge, or an, uh, one of the other folks from that slide. Could you tell us more about these Quakers and other influences on your theology? Sure. Um, so, um... Nazizri Malala Rutledge um, actually was a visitor at Pendle Hill um, uh, earlier, I think it was last year, maybe, or a year before then or whatever. Um, and uh, she was, uh, and still is very involved in um, sort of civil society um, construction in South Africa. So um, post apartheid, um, South Africa has had to reimagine itself, um, sort of recreate its society from the ground up. And as you might have seen recently, they're struggling with that. And they've been struggling since um, the, uh, you know, the, the TRC uh, process. But what she does is she's actually, she's been involved in, you know, that civil work as a civil servant. And she sort of brings to um, her work, you know, her, her Quaker um, foundation. And she will speak, you know, from that foundation as if she was sort of doing this work as a Quaker. So she's not even a theologian you know, in terms of this like specific sense, like, you know, you claim yourself to be. But I think she's a theologian in the way that many of us actually are theologians in that they're living out their Quakerism in the work they do. So she's somebody who's working in, you know, the these bureaucracy and civil governments of South Africa. Um, and this, the other people I mentioned, um, I, I mean, would you want me to go through the list really quickly or? I might invite folks, if you uh, want to get the names, um, they will be on the recording on YouTube. Um, and given we only have a couple of minutes left, I would invite folks to just know that resource will be free and available to you to check. Then you can click ahead to the end and or you can click ahead to the point in the slide and you can pause it and get the names from Christy then. because. Um, Y'all um, who've been sitting on your questions, I've all submitted them in these last 10 minutes. I have many that I'd love, and we will we'll not get to all of them, but I would love to share um, a little bit more of these. Um, there's a couple questions around this sort of ten this tension you were describing or identifying between mechanistic thinking and interconnected framing. And um, a couple of folks are requesting if you could give some more examples of mechanistic pitfalls that maybe you hear in Quaker spaces or um, the or interconnected phrases that you hear and, and, and play out a little more the, the tension between those frames. Sure. Um, uh, first, I want to give a shout out to um, someone who's kind of written about this sort of mechanistic challenge in, um, in Quakers a great deal, Sharice Bach. Um, she's a friend and you should definitely look at um, her work. Um, but this, uh, if we think about mechanistic thinking, um, we can really think of it as sort of rooted in the, you know, in the, the thinking of Rene Descartes. You know, I think, therefore I am. So if you have thought, if you have rationality, if you have reason as we imagine it to be, um, then therefore you exist. So it's easier to think of, you know, humans as being sort of um, the only things that think in the, the same way that we think. So we can sort of dismiss the value of other things, right? We can see them as below us and we can sort of create a hierarchy of beings in the world, all right? So what, what flows from that would be, uh, for example, um, sometimes I, I've encountered uh, when people talk about what happens in meeting, they say, well, I am um, I'm meditating. 
um, which is absolutely gorgeous and wonderful. Um, but it, 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 it sort of places this idea of like what worship is, is I am sitting here and I am either thinking or I am trying to clear thought. But you're still engaging with thought somehow. Either it's process or it's lack. And why I want to emphasize, you know, thinking about this as worship instead, that, that our lives are worship, you know, and that that is being a much more integrated way of thinking is that, you know, all of what we're doing, all of who we are is present in worship. We are breathing. We are sitting. We are, we are moving. We are possibly hearing. We are seeing. We are, we are engaging. We are existing. We don't cease to be for an hour and we just sort of plunk up in our head. Even if you are engaging in meditation, you know, you are still trying to integrate your whole being. You're trying to unlock this sort of head body dualism so that you actually can breathe in and through your whole spirit. So, you know, another way of, you know, thinking about it is that, you know, for example, if we think about a gathered meeting, if you've ever had the, the absolute grace to have been in a gathered meeting, you know that um, the spirit is just moving through the room. You feel it. It exists. It hangs like this sort of this fog and cloud that everyone breathes in and experiences because we are all open to the spirit moving between us. And when we think about what brought us first into Quakerism, we often have similar narratives, similar stories that link back to the stories of the first friends where they would sit and they would feel themselves like blown away by, you know, the power of this. Like I remember that, you know, this um, uh, uh, one example um, from Elizabeth Fry's life where she sits in worship and then suddenly she like just is blown away. She's overwhelmed with the sense of both you know, the, 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 the silliness and pettiness of what she'd been experiencing in her life beforehand, but also the power of the spirit moving through her. And that sort of almost sweeps through her body. And in a way, it actually kind of clears out all this gunk and she's integrated again. And then she finally, at that moment, that's when the enlightenment comes. The mind can only interact truly when it's actually fully engaged with the body. So I think, you know, if we, if we then sort of think about, you know, I mean, I can, I imagine you could probably think about mechanistic enlightenment, like in our world, the very fact that we're all talking through a screen, you know, um, we talk about interdependence as a, a network, okay, as an internet network. But, you know, I've got three and a half bars right now. Um, the network goes down, but the divine doesn't. So, you know, just even on one level, it's not the internet. No, it's the atmosphere. It's the whole environment around us. That's a better way of thinking about it. So, and I wanna stress the idea of interdependence. Um, this is really hugely important if you're thinking about like eco-theology particularly, this idea that we can use, you know, we, we can think about the world and our environment, our, you know, ecology um, in such a way that we can see the divine in it and then we can learn from it that, that way. Um, there's a sense of interdependence being, you know, absolutely key to that because the world inherently is an ecosystem. And then in eco-theology, the divine is continuously giving life to the ecosystem. The divine is in many ways that which animates the ecosystem. It is in us. It is around us. I'm hearing Yoda right now, you know, like the force, but it actually kind of works in a way. Um, the interdependence as a, as a vision, you know, um, it, 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 it sort of separates us from like ways of Christian thinking where we think of like, I have to worry about my save, you know, my salvation and my salvation alone where sin is individual. You know, I sinned this way, therefore I must be saved. 
Whereas in reality, the divine is saving all of us or none of us. And saving is just simply being present within us. So if we think about salvation, it's already happened. It's just how do we experience that? And are we open to that salvation, just the, the divine being within us or not? Well, we're nearing our end here. And I do want to end with some brief silence um, and waiting worship and then give you a moment, Christy, just to end um, with a, a final thought for us or a final piece of theology for us. Um, and I will just invite folks um, to join us next month. We will not be having our first Monday in September on the first Monday. Flag. Misnomer. False advertising. Our first Monday, quote unquote, lecture in September will actually be September 13th. Um, and it will be our Carrie lecture, um, which is sort of an annual tradition at Pendle Hill. We'll be hearing from Vanessa July. Um, and more about that will be available on the Pendle Hill website in the coming days. But just as a reminder to everyone here that in September, our first Monday will actually be September 13th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. With that, I invite us to settle into some silence and Christy for you to close us as close to nine as we can. <laughs> I want to thank you for um, staying the whole time, friends. Um, and I want to implore you to, um, to take seriously the beauty of our tradition and to see it as one which should be shared and it should be reflected upon and it should be learned from. And a key element of that is looking at it theologically. So I implore you to, if at all possible, start reimagining what theology could mean. And with that new lens, that new perspective, re-engage with our beautiful tradition. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Christy. All right. Have a lovely evening, friends. Thank you very much.